was a robber. Chapter 19, verse number 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hand. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Then Jesus answered, or the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard the, that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Verse number 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Father, I just want to thank you right now. You came to fulfill your word, and you did fulfill your word. And today we are reminded that you will always keep your word. Your word will come to pass. Yes. No matter how many rise up in opposition, they are no match for you. God, I pray today that we would not be living life our own way, or we would be living life without the greatest relationship we could ever have, and that is our relationship with a risen Savior. I pray today, God, that the declaration over our life not, would not be that we had failed, but that we had nailed it, just as you intended for us to live. Today, this Resurrection Sunday, may it be a day of victory yes. over every foe, in Jesus' name, and everybody here said, Amen. 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 I, I want to talk to you a little bit about Jesus being nailed to the cross. There were different people who had different motives as to why they nailed something to the cross. And we, we traditionally think of, of the fact that Jesus was nailed there, and he was. He was nailed to the cross by the religious authority. But I, I want to tell you that there were three different reasons that he was nailed to the or nailed to the cross. 
One was due to his authority. The second reason was he was nailed to the cross because of his identity. And third, he was nailed to the cross because of his divinity. First of all, the religious authorities nailed him to the cross because of his authority, because of his power. Pilate declared, on at least three different occasions, I find no fault with him. I, what, what kind of judicial system finds a person completely and totally innocent and sends him to capital punishment anyway? Pilate said, I find no fault with him. He, he confessed that to the religious authorities. He said, what do you want me to do with him? He's your king. What do you want me to do with him? And, and lastly, he says this. I, I wash my hands of this. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I, I, we, my wife and I, we were talking about this the other day. And she said, even Pilate washed his hands. I want to encourage you during this season, make sure you wash your hands. I, I, I got a, a, a minister that I know, and he was traveling here recently, and he came through, and, and he did a little, a little Facebook Live video, and it said, guys, wash your hands. <laughs> and, and, and so I want to encourage you today, use the hand sanitizer, use the soap, but I will tell you, when it comes to, to guilty blood on your hands, you can wash it with hand sanitizer, you can wash it with soap and water. You can do everything that you think that you can do. But you will never get out blood stains off of your hands, especially of Jesus, without him being the one that says, I forgive you and I take away that stain. Mm -hmm. Jesus, in actuality, was a threat to the religious authorities. He um, was a threat that could not be tolerated. When threatened with loss of authority, that is why Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. It's why King Herod tried to kill Jesus at his birth. Some people will do anything to hang on to power. We, we see that even in our day and time. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. They will even kill to hang on to power. When, when I first became the pastor of Merit Assembly of God, uh, 27 years ago, it wasn't long after that, that there was an elderly man that uh, was very precious to me. He walked into church, and one Wednesday night, we had church, and it was a crowded house. It was him and me, and I can still take you to the spot. We were having the conversation, and we were talking about some of the things that he had lived through, and he said, Bob, it's really simple to stay a dictator in power. All you have to do is be willing to kill your own people. Thank God that we do not serve in a dictatorship. Thank God we live under the mandate of the King of Heaven. Who is, is, he's not hanging on to power out of an ego. He is hanging on to power for our benefit. For mankind, the biggest struggle we face is the fact that we are called to relinquish our authority and our power and submit to God. A lot of people want deliverance from sin, but they don't want to honor the Lord as the Lord of their life. And so we must relinquish our authority and we must embrace the authority of Jesus. What they did not realize was that all true authority comes from God. It's a gift to be stewarded. It is to be used to build others up not to destroy them. It is temporary because we are only going to be on this earth scene for, for a season of time. It is fleeting. It is amazing how quickly time flies. Uh, this last week, a, 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 a memory popped up on Facebook, and they said, Facebook said, we thought we'd, you'd want to be reminded about what happened, and it was six years ago. And it was like six years ago already. It, it, it happened, time flies by so fast. Authority is to be utilized to honor God and not just to exalt ourselves. It is when we submit to God that we are truly empowered. Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me. Go ye therefore into all the world. It is when we are truly empowered. Jesus' authority doesn't 
suppress us. It's not there to squash us down. It, his authority actually launches us into the life that he's wanted us to live all along. When it comes to the evaluation of the religious leaders and the fact that they, let me, let me get my hammer here, and that they nailed Jesus to the cross, they failed it. I have no idea how an illustrated sermon is going to come out on Facebook Live, <laughs> but uh, they, they used their hammer to nail Jesus to the cross to keep their own authority, and they failed. Amen. They failed. The second person that we want to talk about that had something nailed to the cross was Pilate. Pilate nailed, to the, nailed Jesus to the cross because of his identity. He nailed Jesus to the cross because of who he is. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. It is who he is. It is his identity. Pilate wasn't impressed with Jewish authority. He, he really didn't enjoy dealing with those people at all. He had the charge or accusation against Jesus nailed to the cross above his head. And the charge had to do with his identity. It didn't say anything about the fact he was a sinner because Pilate found no fault with him. He examined him thoroughly and found no fault. It simply said this, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That was the charge that uh, took him to the cross. Nothing about that charge is untrue. It is his name, Jesus, means God saves. And he still saves. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus of Nazareth. They thought that Nazareth was his origin, but they didn't realize that his origin actually went much further back to the, to the throne of glory. And it talks about his dominion, the king of the Jews, though his domain extends extend so much further than just one ethnicity. He is the king. He is the king of kings. Amen. He's our soon coming king. Amen. Amen. Let's not forget that about Easter, about the resurrection. It means he's coming again. He's a God who keeps his, his, uh, his word. Jesus is the same before the cross, on the cross, and after the cross. Let me just remind you about who he is. He is God. Amen. We could stop there. That's a God, great big G. Okay? That, that, is, that is all that, that needs to be said, but we'll add to it. He is eternal. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is everything in between. He is all-powerful. There is no weapon formed against him that will prosper. There is no threat that will ever um, overtake him. There is no coup against him that will ever be successful. He is all-powerful. He is wisdom. He is shrewd beyond description. He is wisdom personified. He is compassionate. I will tell you this, the devil hates you and Jesus loves you. Yes. The devil is motivated to act in your life and my life as a, as a thief that comes to steal, to kill and destroy. Because every time he sees you, he is reminded of the image of God. And he hates that image. And so everything he does in our lives is because of how much he hates you. In the same manner, everything that Jesus does in our lives is because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. He is love personified, and he is moved with compassion, not just in the New Testament, but in your life and in my life as well. He is truth. And there is no deception in him. Do you realize that it is impossible for God to lie? On the other hand, the devil is a liar. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his native language because there is no truth in him. Jesus is our righteousness. Hallelujah. He is our standard. Amen. Other people are not your standard. Right. Jesus is. And today, I'm so thankful that he imputes his righteousness to us. He is life. As I was studying for this message, 
uh, there, there was a person that said, we have to come to realize that until we ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life, though we were breathing in our body, we were dead in our spirit, in our trespasses and our sins. Jesus comes a lot, comes into our life, and he is the resurrection. I talked to a person just here recently who talked about that uh, um, what it was like to be revived, that the power of God comes into us as a spiritual being and literally takes that which is dead and imparts life to us. Praise God. Amen. He is our life. He is Lord. He has the first say. He has the last say. And it is His declaration that is absolutely vital. He is our Savior because we need a Savior. He is our healing that is able to heal of every sickness, of every disease, and every infirmity. And I, I'm, I'm still looking forward to the day where we see Jesus manifest in our day and time like we did in the scripture where entire villages of people would be healed of every affliction and disease. I also want to remind you this. There are a lot of people who want to take this out, but I will tell you this. He is the judge. The Bible makes it very clear that he is the judge. He's the lawgiver. Now that's a very dangerous combination for fallen man, but it is a glorious uh, combination when you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is mercy. He is the king. And today, we are reminded, he is the resurrection. That's the identity of Jesus. It is the relationship we have with Jesus that is a threat to every other religion on the world because they do not want to acknowledge the exclusive relationship that we have with Jesus. Christianity is not a religion, it is a relationship with a God who is absolutely perfect. <clears throat> In the same manner, knowing who we are is vital. We are born sinners who need a Savior. I, I, a lot of people think that it's just people who do horrible things that are, are sinners. I've got, good, I've got bad news for you. It's the other way around. It's because we're sinners we do bad things. And all of us miss the mark. All of us miss the mark. I, I, was, uh, I, I was in an atmosphere here recently where there was some target practice going on. And the, the one thing that I understood about that target practice session was everybody missed the target. I don't know if anybody ever hit the target. Jesus comes along and enables us and empowers us to be delivered from missing the mark that God wanted us to have to where we strike it. Once we are born again, once we've asked Jesus into our life, we are no longer sinners, we're saints. And the power of sin is broken. I want to remind you of your identity in Christ today. You are created by God, in the image of God, according to the timing of God, for the purpose and the pleasure of God. Let me tell you today, let me remind you on this day, you are not a cosmic accident. You are intentionally created and strategically placed in time and geography according to God's holy purpose for your life. Pilate had authority, but he didn't understand identity. And because he didn't stand in integrity, he didn't recognize truth when it stood right before him. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone who you were telling them the truth, but because of how corrupt they were, they didn't believe a word that you told them. I've had that happen. People who have no spiritual identity or no understanding about it are threatened by people who know who they are, why they are here, and where they are going. Today, I want to declare to you your identity with Jesus living in your heart. You are a child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Where or, or why are you are here? You are here for the purpose and the pleasure of God. You are to be a witness unto all the world, wherever you go, testifying of the goodness of God. And I can tell you where you're going. You are going to the plans and purposes that God has 
prepared for you, and you're going to an eternity with Jesus where you are going to be with him and ruling and reigning forever and ever. Praise God. When it came to Pilate at the cross, he nailed the sign, but he failed according to the purpose. I want to want to take you to the uh, the book of First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two, because not only were was the religious leadership in uh, involved in Jesus' crucifixion, not only was Pilate involved in the crucifixion, but also principalities and powers were involved in the crucifixion. Verse number six says this: of First Corinthians chapter two. However we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In Colossians chapter 2 Verse number 15 says this, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of, spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The demons knew who Jesus was. We know who you are. What do you want with us? It was never their, their, their confusion about who he was. But they did not understand his plan. I am so thankful that God is smarter than the devil. Amen. 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 The demons thought they knew who Jesus was, but didn't know his plan. And they thought when they motivated and moved everything to the cross, they thought that they had outwitted God. I don't know if you've ever met a person that thought that they were smarter than God. But I can tell you this, it's only a matter of time until they realize that they're not. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. They Amen. thought that they had overpowered him. You know, what is your name? We're legion, for we are many. I want to remind you, it didn't matter if every demon in hell had gathered and taken up residence in that man. At the declaration of Jesus, they had to go. Amen. They knew that when Jesus showed up, yes, that yes, their yes. stay in that location had changed forever. Amen. They thought they had overpowered him. They thought that when he said, it is finished, and died on the cross, they thought that they had defeated him. They thought they had destroyed the eternal Son of God. They thought wrong. Actually, at the cross, Jesus destroyed the devil and all his works. They were nailing him, the spiritual principalities and powers, they were nailing Jesus to the cross because they understood his divinity. Okay? But at the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, destroyed the devil and his works. I love those two verses. Two, one truth encompassed in two different verses that Jesus came and destroyed the devil and he destroyed all of his work. Amen. I, I love that. At the cross, Jesus achieved his greatest victory. At the cross, Jesus omnipotent, thoroughly overpowered and rendered useless the enemy. At the cross, Jesus' wisdom proved far superior to theirs so that they regretted, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, ever launching the attack in the first place. That is my prayer for you. That is my prayer for me. That every time the enemy launches an attack against you, whether it is spiritual, whether it is physical, or financial, or persecutorial, it doesn't matter. I pray that every time he launches an attack, that Jesus turns that situation around yeah. and promotes you and, and elevates you in your understanding of God. And the devil said, I wish I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. At the cross, the demons recognized him. And because of the cross, 
they tremble and await their final judgment. They thought that they had reduced the divine down to a human being that could be wiped out of existence. And they found out that that <coughs> wasn't going to happen at all. At the cross, they thought that they had made a public spectacle out of Jesus. But at the cross, Jesus was making a public spectacle out of them all. When it comes to the cross, the principalities and powers failed it. In Colossians chapter 2, I want to read to you verse number 8. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Let me just say this to you today. The, the resurrection of Jesus has a message for you and I, and that is that we are supposed to be dead to our trespasses and sin, and we are supposed to be raised by the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, quickened in our mortal bodies, and operating with a divine unction. We are operating in spiritual dynamic now, not carnal dynamic. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that are against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over this over them in it. Where the religious authorities failed, where Pilate failed, where the principalities and powers had failed, Jesus would truly nail it. He, he had a message to, to nail to the cross. Where they nailed his identity We had accusations against us as well. Every sin that we've ever done, every ungodly thought that we've ever thought, Jesus nailed it to the cross for our victory. Amen. Thank you. Today, if, you're, if you understand that you are living a defeated life, I've got great news for you today. Jesus didn't go to the cross for you to live a defeated life. He went to the cross so you can live a victorious life. Amen. Over every, everything that has ever been launched against you, Jesus will prevail. Amen. Amen. He, he nailed it to the cross. Jesus always gets the last word. Yes. His presence on the cross demonstrated his authority over the cross and the authorities that nailed him there. The accusing sign of the cross testified to all that his kingdom reigns even at the cross. Satan's jurisdiction came to an abrupt halt where the blood was spilt. And God's wisdom shines its brightest at the cross and makes a mockery of Satan's plan. Do you realize that the devil is quite perplexed as to why he's not successfully taken you out yet? And I can tell you this, it is because of the grace of God. The resurrection of Jesus is a divine reversal at the cross. The cross looked like a place of failure, but it was actually a place of victory. It looked like it was a hopeless place. But instead, it was the place where faith was born. It looked like a place of death, but it has become the place of everlasting life for you and I. 
But make no mistake that the accuser of the brethren still nails his accusation to our lives. He assails us with claims that are just as true as the charge that they nailed above the head of Jesus. Without Jesus, I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how powerful you are or how famous you are. I don't care how good you think you are. Apart from Jesus, we are sinners. Yes. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A number of people, I, I remember having conversation with a, a person one time, and, and they, were, they were quite convinced in their own goodness and that God was going to let them into heaven simply because they were good. And I, I, want, to, I want to tell you, I, I said, well, let me ask you, this was a teenager, I said, have you ever lied to your parents? And they said, well, yes. And they said, you mean to tell me that God would judge me because I lied to my parents? And I will tell you this, the, the answer to that question is it's not because of the lie, it is because of the broken perfection that God was looking for out of humanity. <coughs> we are sinners. We have been unfaithful. Any, anybody here ever been unfaithful to God? Yeah. Amen. I, I have a feeling that there's a lot of, of us here, namely all of us. We've been idolaters. We've worshipped other things. We have worshipped greed. We have broken the Sabbath. That was one that God has been dealing with me of recently, is, is that I need to honor God by enabling him to work while I rest. Amen. Amen. We have sinned with our word. We have blasphemed. We have spoken evil about things that we don't understand. We have spoken bad things about God. And we have, even at times, people use their mouth to profane the name of God and make it just another common word. We have lied and we have hated one another. We have stolen and been immoral. We have coveted and dishonored others. We have not loved people and loved God the way that God would have us to. In actuality, before Christ comes into our heart, we are servants of sin, slaves of sin, and there is nothing that we can do to set ourselves free. We need a Savior. But because of Jesus, today we have the opportunity to ask Jesus, the King of Kings with all authority on heaven and earth, to speak to the hordes of hell and their charges against us. Today his response to the accusations against us, and I don't think you can see this on the camera very well, but it simply says this, Forgiven! <laughs> Forgiven! No. It's not because I'm innocent of the charges. It's because I was guilty of the charges. But Jesus went to the cross for me, and he went to the cross for you, and he wiped away those sins. He took his own blood and washed it away, and there is nothing that you and I could ever do to repay such a tremendous expression of his love. At the cross, his statement nails it. It declares that we are not only released from the acts of sin that we have done. Praise God. Amen? Amen? Now we are servants of righteousness. We don't have to sin anymore. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't have to. Before, we couldn't help ourselves. Now, we have been provided a way of escape. His name is Jesus, and he comes to do a work in our heart. We are, are, are released from the act of sin, but also we are released from the authority of that sin over us, and that word forgiven, that declaration forgiven, it destroys the condemnation of the devil. And I will add one more thing. It also destroys the guilt that you carry that you carried around with you about what you had done. You see, the devil will never tell you the full price tag of that sin. He thinks, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Eve, it's not that big of a deal. Just go ahead and eat of this tree. I know God said not to, but he's holding out on you. And then when 
they ate of it, they realized that God did not exaggerate. It was death. It was death. A lot of people think, I know better. I would just go ahead and do this. Nobody's going to get hurt. And not realizing that it has the potential to deliver pain for decades. You see, Jesus forgives us of our sins. And he forgets them. He wipes it all away. But can I tell you something? The devil doesn't forget your sin. And a lot of times it's very difficult for us to forgive ourselves. And if that's you today, I want to tell you something. Jesus has a higher standard than you do. Allow him to come in and cleanse your heart and cleanse your mind and, and position you as a, as a minister of the love of God and the mercy of God because people still need to hear today that Jesus nailed it at the cross. He nailed our sin, not in part, but the whole. I don't know if you realize that everything that we sang today was talking about Jesus' triumph at the cross. Triumph at the empty tomb. And today, I, I want to I tell you, he did not fail in his mission. He nailed it. I want to invite you to stand with me where you are. Seriously, you, you might be at home. You, you might be all, all by yourself. You might be watching on your phone. And now, if you're driving in your car... Don't stand up right now. That's, that could have catastrophic. If you're watching Facebook on, in your car right now, that's even, that's even bad too. But wherever you are, I want you to, to picture yourself that you have just been called out of darkness into his marvelous light and that today is a day of victory, not a day of defeat. And I want you to picture yourself. See, the, the, the principalities and thou powers thought they were making a spectacle of Jesus but they didn't realize Jesus was going to make a spectacle of them. Everything that's ever held you captive has been defeated. And today, you can drag those things before the throne of cross and, and throne of Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to thank you today that you have given me the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This day belongs to Jesus. Resurrection day, it belongs to Jesus. The virus didn't create this day. Jesus did. And I want to invite you right now to just lift up your voice and praise, uh, praise the name of Jesus because he has set us free. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you right now. God, we know that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were just waiting for an eternity apart from you. But Jesus, you came and you took the, the, the shame of the cross. Lord, it was supposed to be a, cur a place of cursing, and you turned it into a place of blessing. God, you, you changed my life forever. You changed my family's life. You, you give us hope and a future. And God, because of your resurrection today, we, we do not mourn as the, as the world mourns when a loved one passes away. For we know, Lord, there's another resurrection that is coming there is coming a day when we are going to be launched into the presence of Jesus and sin and temptation and death and sorrow have no power there. God, I want to thank you, however, that we do not have to wait for that day to celebrate victory. You rule and reign right now. Yes, you pray your kingdom come, yes. your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray, God, right now that we would not fail to live the life that you died and rose again for us to live. Yes. God, I'm so thankful that you nailed it at the cross. Yes. I want to thank you that my sin was nailed to the cross and it is splattered with the truth of God. These are forgiven in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that every principality and power in our lives God, that it would be crushed under our feet, that we would be walking in dominion and victory over those according to the liberty that you have provided for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, if there's anybody today who is living in fear, I pray today, God, that you would remind them you're the risen Savior. 
You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No weapon formed against you prospered, and it will not prosper when it comes to us as well. God, I want to thank you. If you're, if you're watching right now, and you have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life, I want to, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you came and lived a perfect life but died on the cross for my sin. I thank you, God, that you have all authority. I thank you that you are not just the king of the Jews, but you are my king. I thank you, God, that you defeat every principality and power and make a public spectacle over them. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Humiliate the enemy at every turn. And empower me to live the life that you want me to live. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you, if you just prayed that prayer, I, I want to encourage you to contact us. You can call us 321-454-4263. You can, you can reach out to us uh, via meritassembly.com. You can send us an email. You can mail us a letter. If you contact us, we, we will give you what you need to grow in your relationship with God. I want to conclude today by telling you this. Today, your enemy is defeated. Yes. He is helpless. Oh, yes. And he is humiliated because at the cross, Jesus nailed it. God bless you so much. We will see you Wednesday night right here on Facebook Live. God bless you.